Okay. So uh, as we're moving into kind of the deeper part of the plotting structure of mythology and of books, which is the, the, the road of trials, it's the descent of the journey, the initiation, the part of initiation, we're not yet that yet there in initiation, we are still in the descent. And we're walking along the path of a hero's journey. But just to begin, let's listen to a poem by my favorite po poet at the moment and the theme really of um, this course, uh, Marie Howe. And this poem is called Hurry. And we, I will play, uh, we'll just sp speak about it a little bit later. So just leaning back, sitting up in your chairs. I like to take, if you want to close your eyes, the invitation is there to take three conscious, deep, long breaths. Just marking with a huge inhale and an exhale, a shift in the day. That moment in which you step out of work, out of function, out of children, out of typing, out of emailing, and you move into the world of creativity. And so just allowing that subtle shift in the energy body as all those other things stay outside the threshold and only the ideas which begin to percolate stay inside. And so keeping either the eyes closed or open, whatever suits, listen to these words. Hurry. We stop at the dry cleaners and the grocery store and the gas station and the green market and hurry up, honey, I say, hurry, hurry, as she runs along two or three steps behind me, her blue jacket unzipped and her socks rolled down. Where do I want her to hurry to? To her grave, to mine, where one day she might stand all grown. Today, when all the errands are finally done, I say to her, honey, I'm sorry I keep saying hurry. You walk ahead of me, you be the mother. And hurry up, she says over her shoulder, looking back at me laughing. Hurry up now, darling, she says. Hurry, hurry, taking the house keys from my hands. And just sitting in that moment of not hurrying, of expansiveness, and just noticing where all that hurry is in your life. So just taking your pen and paper, and I hope you have one nearby, you can type it if you want. I'm gonna pose a question to you, and then I'm gonna ask you to write four things. So the first question, which you're going to answer in writing, and then you're going to read out. I'm going to pop you in groups and you're going to just share this. Is where are you hurrying to? I'll put this up in the groups this way, when you go through. The second question, what are the two best things about your book or your writing right now? And the second thing is what are the two worst things about your book or your writing right now and then the fourth thing to write one two three i always get my numbers wrong is what is the one sentence that your critic keeps saying in your head that voice that internal voice that keeps telling you what is it saying to you persistently about your writing yeah, so I want you to write those down. I'm going to give you a few minutes and then I'm going to split you up to share those in the groups. So what are you hurrying to? I'm going to be about five minutes and then the two worst, best things about your book, the two worst things and the voice, the inner critic is whispering in your ear about your writing, about your book, about this journey And what I'm going to do is I'm 
reasons not to write. So yeah, all of them are very valid reasons not to write. And uh, I'm having that at the moment because I've also been writing. Um, and I think the, the voice in my head keeps saying, who cares? Who cares? Why is this interesting to anybody but you? Um, and I think that's something we grapple with when we are writing about ourselves. Is it of interest? Mm. Is, it, is anybody going to read it? Is this embarrassing? Um, so we, you know, we're coming up with all these things that are stopping us writing. Um, and also the one about, is there a better story is such a powerful one. And um, so many writers don't finish because it's like, oh, this isn't working. You know, I'm just going to put this aside. So I had a, uh, a fascinating chat um, actually recently with an author, I think it was yesterday, who was telling me that like 10 years ago, they wrote a novel and they sent it to one beta reader and the beta reader kind of told them all the things that were wrong with it. And it's been in the bottom drawer ever since. And I had a little bit of a moment of pang because I send books to beta readers and I want to tell you that the job of a beta reader or a manuscript to praise or an editor like me or, or a publisher is always to tell you what's wrong. So it's quite interesting because that's you, you think you're helping somebody. Um, you go, but you could do that better and this can change and whatever. Um, and I asked her to take the book out and reread it and tell me what she thought of it now, 10 years later. And she messaged me that yesterday evening and said, Sarah, it's actually really good. It's got flaws, it's got issues, but it's not as bad as I thought. And I do want to say that most of you sitting where you are with your level of thought process or education or life learning or whatever's been going on, what you are writing is probably quite good. The only question is, what does it take to get to the end? And that's one of the harder questions to answer because actually it takes a lot. And some of you, like Brenda, who's got all the way to a finished first draft and others of you have written a, a book, just know that it's just a long journey. And sometimes we just want to give up on a long form writing. So the harder thing is, should I keep going? The answer is usually yes. Don't start another book, keep going. And so the place we at really reflects this kind of place in the book, the hero's journey, which we also call the sticky middle, which is that place in a story in which it's kind of the working part of the book. So your email last week would have said to you, like, that is what you're starting to do. You've pulled them into the world. And now it's really we're following you on your journey or the hero on the journey. And the first thing I want to introduce to you is the art of withholding information. So that's just the first thing I wanted to chat about today in the craft of writing. Withholding information from the reader and often from the hero. So how does that look like uh, in, in writing? It can mean, you know, that you don't know it's your father. You don't know where they are or that the reader doesn't really know much about the hero, because we think we want to reveal everything up front. But, but, uh, but, but in terms of plotting, you roll things out slowly, so the reader learns this, and then they learn that. So with every character you are driving into your story, I want you to ask yourself, am I revealing too much? or too little, but more than that, am I revealing information in stages to the reader? A little bit more, a little bit more, we warm up to you. And if you think of those longer series books, um, I mean, just think of the Harry Potter, for example, of, of how that character, we begin with very little information. He just lives under a stair and it grows and grows. But more so the, the books, the, the kind of contemporary novels where we have a, a hero, who is, I'm um, sorry, I'm doing it off. Um, we follow in 10, 15 books, you know, it can be a Michael Connolly, it can be a Detective Harry Bosch, it can be a Detective Rebus, it can be an assassin in the Sarah J. Maas series. But we start to, and what you're learning is slowly more about the character. So we often want to reveal too much. But with the reason we're discussing this is because we are on the road of trials. Important. That's the real stomping ground of story the road of trials because what's happened 
is we've entered that and on this and we're on the journey and we want to go to the highs and lows and that's where your world building becomes so very important where is this happening you know who are the people we are meeting on the journey with you and what are they doing to make this so hard for you so penny's comment about her family you know that not everybody makes everything hard but there's a whole load of hard graft going on in this road of trials so we're on the road of trials and the, the the place we're moving to at the moment in the journey together is the place that in the architect in the um candle is called the approach to the cave and i love this whole sp sp the way it's framed the approach to the cave because the cave is the innermost cave it's the dark night of the soul but we don't want to just arrive there in a story because we want a little bit of a plot to happen, it's particularly in a novel. So we want our hero or you to approach the cave and slowly and gingerly, because before you get there, you must gather information. And on the approach, and as you start to think about this arc of your story, where you are going to, towards a stand-up, towards a shift or turn in your life, things information is happening you may be gathering opinions you may be soliciting advice you may be stop gathering maps you may be plotting the route you may be calling a meeting you may be doing any of these things you may be analyzing the evidence so we want to hold the reader in this place where we are approaching what the reader can see is going to be a showdown of some sorts so it depends on what that showdown is and that is the place we are in in this week the approach to the cave because on this approach to the cave there are two archetypes we're going to meet and i want to just introduce them verbally to you today and you're going to get some exercises on them and the first is the goddess and the second is the woman as temptress and both of these are challenges the hero must overcome in the journey. So the woman as goddess, it's such an interesting um, word and a use of woman. So I'm trying to mute everybody who's not muted. There we go. Um, and, the, and most often in the traditional archetypal way of a masculine hero meeting a female goddess, it would literally virtually be you meet the love of your life. You meet the woman. You know, princess, beauty meets the princess. Um, but in, and, and, but in, 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 a, in a bigger union structure, it really goes more to the meeting of the other within. So if you're, you know, and, and that's really what it's speaking about. It, if you are an, um, a, a driven person, you're meeting the soft feminine. So um, the question I'm asking at this call is who are the soft and fierce feminine figures in your story? And much like a table and I'm going to ask you to draw a circle like the round table King Arthur had and I want you to put yourself at the head so I'm going to put Sarah down here at the head of the table and then I'm going to ask on the left of you who is the compassionate protective mother figure in your book or in your life so that's the first character who's going to sit at the table with you And I want you can write one name or you can write three names down there. And the next character I'm going to ask you to sit, seat at the table is the best friend. Your best friend. So this can be pertaining to your character if you're writing a novel. But if it's not a novel, this is in your life. And I want one of those. So the next characters or the people I'm inviting to your table are three wise women in your life. Three wise women. So 
So just jot their names down. And if there's no name that comes up, just leave a space and write that down. And the next character you may invite to your circle at this table are sisters. Very different kind of character. So these, any of these can be biological and also not biological. So three sisters. And then the next three seated at your table are three daughters. So who are these people in your life that occupy that role? And then I'm going to ask you to appoint in your life or in your book some captains. And captains are the people who are in your army and they're going to execute your orders. They're the people who, if you say, I need you to go fetch my car from Spain, they're there, doesn't matter what time it is at night. The people who you say, I need you to X, Y, Z, they're those people who are going to show up and, and be that logistical support. So who are those people who fill that space that you call your world? The feminine world. And the last person to invite at the table, dead or alive, does not matter any of these, is, is, is a grandmother. Different to a wise woman, because it, it's not necessarily the same. Wise women don't have a particular age to them. But a grandmother or a crone is older. And the last person, and this is getting full this table, and this is a very important person. It's the person we're going to speak about next. It's your enemy. The enemy. Now, that may be a harder one to fill, a harder seat to fill. Because enemies are not always obvious. But in all stories, there are those people. So it's a full table. Full of characters we need and full of people in your lives and full of the bigger world that is. So what we do here is we're starting to invite people to step into the story. And the people we began with. So you may have some gaps in your table, right? I'm sure many of you have not got people who fill those roles. But they'll come to you. They'll come to you. I did this exercise recently um, when we were plotting a book with somebody. We didn't have half of these characters. But slowly over the evening, I went, oh, that's the, that's the sister. Okay. And this, of course, is a tribe of women. And we are speaking particularly about women in this because this is this part of the story where woman is the lover and woman is the temptress and woman is the goddess for our hero. So in the email, I'll get her, we'll speak about Kali the destroyer. The Hindu god is Kali. Okay, so because our time is moving on and we've, we've all gone into some thinking space tonight, I want to just stress why I've asked you to write about the enemy because one of the, we're talking about plotting in general. This part about the road of trials is what's going to happen? What's the plot of the journey? And the most basic element of all plotting starts with the fact that you need a hero Something needs to happen, so they're going on a journey, and we have to have a story goal. In other words, when we begin this, we've got to know what they're going to do. So what you may find very often is that you haven't given them something to do. So even when you're working with memoir, and I've just been chatting to an author, she's American, and her journey is very beautiful, and she went to Greece to find her 
family connection which sounds wonderful you know it wasn't really why she went to Greece it was just a trip so we started to say well well what was the reason because you've she's you've got to find a reason we're on this journey with you so we decided that she was on a quest because she came from Greece and then when I teased it out with her even more I found out that her grandfather was a famous Greek chocolatier and that when she went back to Greece she actually went to the village and found one of his chocolate recipes and she took it back and she started a chocolate fudge company. In fact, when I say a, a, a chocolatier, it's one of the biggest chocolate brands in the world, by the way. So this all came out only at the end of the telling of the story. And so, of course, in retrospect, we went, ah, this is what it is. But we, this is what it is. It's a quest into the ancestry of your family. But for the reader, we're, 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 we're putting that together, piecing that together in the third draft of her book. Didn't re, it, didn't really, it wasn't really the driving motivation. But for the reader, you want to let them know that that's the quest you're on. So what is the quest you're going on in this book? And you're going to get a list of possible quests or themes in the email later tonight. There are 20 quests or possible. It can be revenge. It can be descent. It can be excess, wretched excess. There's nothing better. A while, you, you're on the search for a wild party. You know, fabulous. There's nothing better. A book about that. Uh, uh, the fabulous memoir uh, that what's that one about the wolf of wall street richard excess okay and the fourth element so you need a hero you need a story goal uh sorry you need a, a, a reason an inciting incident the call to action all the same thing you need a story goal and then the thing you do need in all stories conflict it is the hardest word to get your head around as an author and what is conflict? It comes in a person. So all these people we're writing about, these people invited to your table, they're going to provide some of that. But the most important person in a plotted book, like a novel, which three, some of you are writing, is you have to write that in, in the form of a person. So you personify conflict in that antagonist, that villain. So what I'm going to be sending you this week is some things to do, some things to play with, to take your writing into a deeper place, maybe have more fun with it. Um, and to start filling out those places and the, the feminine, the character you're going to be introduced to the next week, the, 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 the goddess. Um, and that really is the meeting of the other. Okay, so it's, it's hard to sort of explain in this sense, but in all of it, it can be the soulmate. It can be the, the other half. So for example, in let's say Star Wars, it would be the, the brother and sister that were the Leia and whatever the other, I can't even remember his name, but that were separated. It is the other within. Um, but in a very classical structure, and I don't know if I remember in the first call, we spoke about the, the princess and the prince frog prince frog as it's actually called um and the story we ended there ended with the golden ball dropping and the 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 princess making a promise that she would take the frog into the palace with her and of course the frog brought the ball up and what did the princess do the second she got the ball is she turned around and she flipped back to the palace and she left the frog down in the pond so this is already a setup, it's a reversal, because the meeting, the, 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 the goddess you're going to meet for her is the masculine version, the god she's going to meet. And she doesn't know, of course, who it is yet. And then the, the story will continue with the frog arriving at the door of the palace and knocking on the door with the king, turning to his daughter and saying, my love, what you promised, you have to keep. Let the frog in. And when the frog comes into the palace, this scratchy little creature with slime, the princess doesn't want him. And she's, ugh. and he sits by her and eats out of her golden plate. And he wants to lie on her beautiful silken cushion. And in absolute fury and rage, the princess takes the frog and flings him against the wall. And what falls is not a frog at all. 
but it is an ordinary but beautiful young man. And in doing that, we meet the goddess. That's the meeting of the goddess, the meeting of the soulmate, the finding of the other, the, the center of peace. And of course, the story ends, as all good fairy stories do, with them living happily ever after and being blessed with the riches of the land and continuing in a beautiful and bountiful way, ruling the kingdom. So where in your story is the meeting of the goddess? Who is the goddess? And is there a place in which the reader sees this joyous union? And it, it can be romantic and it can be a friend and it can be an inner reunion or a, a reminding of self. Right. And as you're moving on into the next week, are there questions you have? Let's hear who is, okay, what, Tammy, what if the enemy is the system? I know it's, so this is so difficult. In a memoir, it is appropriate. You're fighting the system, okay? You can set that up. But what is important, or you're fighting a, a, a political idea, or you're fighting a bureaucracy, um, and that is appropriate in a memoir. However, I would also urge you for the for the you know the the, the the narration of storytelling to see if there's a figure that represents that for you. So, in a memoir, in a personal story, in personal narrative writing, you can be railing against something. In novel writing, absolutely not. You've got to take that and drive it into an individual. So you can't be, it can't be the Catholic Church. It's got to be the bishop who represents the Catholic Church. And then you've got the cardinal. And then you've got the albino monk. And I'm using the example here of the Da Vinci codes. So there's the levels as well. So if it's the Catholic Church, we want levels of antagonists. So likewise, it's maybe, you know, it's a mob story. Um, but it's not just the Don. Of course, there's the henchmen, there's the thugs, there's the wife. They all represent the mob. Okay, the godfather just sits at the top. So your hero is fighting all of them. All of them. And I just watched such a great movie that really personifies it. And so it's a comic book. So it's, it's not a brilliant literary example, but this is true of any book. The, it's the, uh, the, the Kingsman and it's this young boy. It's a real zero to hero story. The hero's journey, he's a thug. He grows up in the streets of London and he's, he's invited to join a secret society, but he's got to survive all the challenges along the way. And he's got to win the prize, which is the offer to become the Lancelot, which is like a MI5, which, you know, it's a code word for a spy. And, you know, the, it's just a, a question of packing and packing antagonists against him. So his mother is a drunk. So she's an antagonist. She loves him dearly, but she's a drunk. Um, his stepfather is beating him up every time he comes home. And in addition to that, in the tenement building he's living in is a gang of boys. So every time he actually leaves his apartment, they're chasing him. They've got baseball bats. So that's the level of conflict to build in story. Everybody's against you, even if they're your mother. And the danger often in memoir, if you're writing about yourself, is what happens often is you bring somebody in, but you don't let them stay the course. So you bring in an annoying, obnoxious boss, and then he's gone, and you're moving on to the next decade. So often I like to say, keep that one annoying, obnoxious, bo obnoxious boss as a continuous, or the annoying, ratty brother who's like just the golden child and puts you down, whatever it may be. That can be the antagonist, right? But find them in your story. Find them in your story. And build them and make them last the distance. So in the memoir, Million Little Pieces, which is Quitlet, it's an addiction, it's a, quite an old memoir, um, his parents were the antagonist. Why? Because they wanted him sober. How incredibly inconvenient. <laughs> and he will do anything to not. And I mean, a few of you know, not, not, none of you on my one mentorship and the 
the the the one girl is writing about her battle with anorexia and of course the antagonists are both of her parents and her brother and the psychologist and all the school teachers and her friends that all want her to eat and she doesn't so that's how we start to drive conflict more and more and more through the story and you find it it's not obvious you don't go through your life saying well that person's really working against me no you find them in a book and you make them happen. Sharon Osbourne's incredible biography, which I reread. Oh, it's right there. Extreme. Oh, I can't recommend it enough. It's just a great book. Both of her parents, antagonists, literally she fought them until she, the day she died and she did not speak to her mother, I think the last 30 years. But it doesn't matter because that conflict is there the whole time. And so with that, as we move way past 30 minutes, way past, I want to just double check before if there's any questions I can never see. Tammy loves typing her questions in. Okay. So if you type or put your hand up just so I can see as to where we're going. You're going to get a lot of expensive. You'll get an email later tonight. And then there's a whole lot of things that are going to come through. And then I'm just going to end with one more I played this to you guys before. It is a Marie Howe, and it's just talking about poetry and about connecting. So I'm going to play that. It's a short piece, about two minutes, just to listen as we close out. If it plays. Oh, I don't know where I got this. I usually try to so let our heart break open rather than close. Yeah. And I just wonder how you were fit in families and families I'm of origin and old. going through life and becoming a poet and becoming a mother rather late in life. And mm -hmm. how do you think the stakes of that aren't helping us let our heart break open, how the form and the stakes of that are different at different points, different at different points in your life and maybe in all of our lives? Well, that's, that's one of the only choices that we have, right? I mean, things are going to happen all the time. The unendurable happens. You know, people we love, we can't live without are going to die. We're going to die one day. We're going to have to leave our children and die. You know, leave the plants and the bunnies and the sunlight and the rain and all that. I mean, it's not endurable. Poet, art knows that. Art holds that knowledge. All art holds the knowledge that we're both living and dying at the same time. It can hold it. And thank God it can, because nothing out in the capitalistic corporate world is going to shine that back to us. But art holds it. And I think the one of the only choices we have is, you know, are you, you going to remember when John died, you know, um, I realized it's small. I mean, people suffer. People are suffering now an endurable suffering way beyond what I did. Right this minute, someone's in a, in a prison being tortured for no reason. Um, so I don't know how I would live through that without going psychotic. But I did know that when John died, I thought, okay, I can either just let this crack my heart open or closed. And, and open, the good news about open is, you know, I turned around and there were, of course, the billion other people who have lived on this earth who have lost the person they love so much. And there they all were. And it was so great to be in their company, you know? And, and, uh, and uh, alternatively, the day I said to my daughter for the first and maybe only time, when she was four years old, I remember where I was standing in Austin, Texas, making a bed. And she said, why do I have to do it? And I said, because I said so. <laughs> and, and I turned around and there they all were again. There were like millions of people going, you know, yeah, we said it too. <laughs> and I played that to remind you and me why we write. It's because when you write, our storytellers have the voice to share those things that other people can't put down. And in doing so, we join them and they join us. So keep putting it down, keep building it slowly, and it will end somewhere with something something more than other people are just thinking about it, something more than other people are just talking about it. The written form is forever. So keep writing. 
and I will see you all on the Wednesday sprint session. And we've got another three day at home retreat, which was madly brilliant. We all were like, hey, I mean, Vicky, we were like bug eyed after that, but we all got so much done. Kathy was there, Tammy was there. So hope to see so many more of you on that oh, next okay. one. Yes, you were there, Jackie, in and out. In and out. I'll see you hopefully on Wednesday and have a beautiful day further and love to you all. Nayak. Thank you. Night, everyone.